Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first talk in our series that is planned for this academic year that is sponsored through a collaboration between the Duke Islamic Studies Center as well as the Duke Human Rights Center at Keenan. And the overarching theme for us for this year is Muslim America and taking a look uh, at this running theme of civil and human rights, taking a very broad and expansive look at that, allowing lots of space for tensions uh, between those two terms, keeping in mind people like Malcolm, who talked about not being a fan of civil rights, not being a part of the civil rights movement, but very keenly interested in human rights. Um, and acknowledging our gratitude to our friends and partners at Keenan, uh, Suzanne Shanahan, Suzanne Katzenstein, and uh, working with us is really a model of the kind of interdisciplinary collaborative work that we at Duke are striving for. Um, there are sometimes lengths that you go to to make an event timely. In this case, I just want you all to appreciate the fact <laughs> that we had to orchestrate one of the largest resistance <laughs> movements of American athletes just to make this talk sizzle. Um, and it took a lot of work. It took a lot of work, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, and uh, how interesting to live at a time where movements that began as a protest of police brutality and racism are now being pitched as a discussion over a flag and the anthem. And where's that line between liberation and radical politics and a sometimes more vanilla message of inclusiveness, mm -hmm. right? And that's as much of an issue for universities as it is for sports mm -hmm. uh, and, and politics. And for those of us who secretly have a love affair with sport, now we can pretend <laughs> that we're just analyzing it from an <laughs> academic perspective. Um, so how fortuitous that uh, we benefit from the presence of Professor Rosarina Grewal from Yale University, uh, someone who's been exploring these issues of identity, Islam, uh, American politics, going back a long ways, including to some of the uh, some of the folks that we're going to be discussing today, Chris Jackson, aka Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, and, and others. Uh, allow me to just offer a little introduction. Um, Zarina Grawal is a historical anthropologist and a documentary filmmaker whose research focuses on race, gender, religion, nationalism, and transnationalism across a wide spectrum of American Muslim communities. Her first book, Islam is a foreign country, which I think, is that in sarcasm? Fault? Yeah, it's an ironically that... titled. But this is a rookie mistake. Uh, I mean, you should never, never title your first book, or any book, ironically. That's a mistake, but yes. <laughs> yes. Although, I think a lot of Trump voters are like, oh, that sounds yeah, interesting. Exactly. It sounds Just perfect. Thought, Muslim ban, you know. yeah. Um, American Muslims in the Global Crisis of Authority, NYU 2013, an ethnography of transnational Muslim networks that link U.S. mosques to Islamic movements in post-colonial Middle East. And we'll have a discussion if there's such a thing as post-colonial Middle East or if it's just the same colonial crap just recycled um, through debates about the reform of Islam. Her first film, By the Dawn's Early Light, Chris Jackson's Journey to Islam, examines the racialization of Islam and the scrutiny of American Muslims' patriotism long before September the 11th. Her forthcoming book, titled, Is the Quran a Good Book? I, I have, this is a bag. I guess I keep repeating this pattern. It's not, it's not, it's provocative, but not, not ironic. Combines ethnographic, ethnographic and cultural studies analysis with historical research to trace the place of the Islamic scripture in the American imagination, particularly in relation to national debate about tolerance. She has received awards for her writing and research grant from Fulbright, Wenner Gren, and Luce Foundations. Please join me in welcoming Professor Thanks so much um, uh, to uh, Omid, who's a friend and a, and a colleague and, 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 a, and a brother uh, in the resistance and in the fight. And, I, and, and really, it, it's, I, I admire him so much. And I really appreciate the invitation. I also have to say, 
Um, I was at a conference uh, recently on human rights and religion um, at my home institution's law school. And it was a huge conference. There's probably about 200 people there. And many different um, religious, uh, religious uh, traditions were being discussed in relation to human rights. Um, and there were activists and lawyers, uh, policymakers, um, academics from all around the world, including the guy that wrote the Burkini ban uh, legislation, or Burka ban, I'm sorry, in France. I mean, all kinds of different people. This is an interesting mix of people. But it struck me, I gave a talk on Malcolm X and human rights. Um, but everyone else who presented about Islam um, presented about Islam in relation to human rights as though Islam was a barrier to human rights. In other words, Islam was a problem. Right. No other religion was treated as a problem in relation to human rights. Um, and it's, it was actually quite striking to me that, that so often when we, when we talk about religion and human rights, for some reason Islam is sort of treated as a special case, as it, as it somehow has kind of a naturally like oppositional relationship to human rights that is not, sort of not seen that, that kind of like, con, uh, I don't know, kind of like natural antagonistic relationship isn't assumed with like, let's say Buddhism or Hinduism or Christianity or Judaism. It's just Islam that just naturally kind of clashes with human rights, I guess. For some reason, this is sort of a kind of uh, um, pres presumption. And so when I gave this paper about how to imagine thinking about Malcolm X as a, as a, as a human rights activist, um, I don't know, it was, it was um, really sort of, it, it was sort of this odd paper out. So I'm really happy um, to be able to come here today and to actually um, think with you about blackness, Kaepernick, uh, religion, Islam, and um, the, 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 the field of sports um, as a, a, a space in which um, we can think about human rights um, being debated uh, and, and the resistance to that, the sort of shut up and play response, right? Um, and so, you know, whenever, whenever we have professional athletes um, speak out against injustice and oppression, there's always this, this split that we see again and again um, with people saying, either there's those of us who celebrate um, athletes who do that as a kind of act of courage, and there's others who dismiss it as hypocrisy um, and, 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 and posturing. And so um, on Friday, we of course saw President Trump, um, you know, uh, I don't know, I guess um, resurrect his... Uh, his um, catchphrase from his TV show, You're Fired, uh, when he suggested that any of the protesters who were following Kaepernick's example should in fact be fired, um, that they were sons of bitches, and that he also dis disinvited the Golden State Warriors, um, as you know. And then of course this essentially created what happened on Sunday, um, which I guess Omid is behind all of that, that's fantastic. Uh, but, but you know, this, this, in other words, things, things have escalated once again. And, and so, um, you know, watching that, I have to say I have a little bit of mixed feelings because on the one hand, it's wonderful to see a nationwide protest in this moment. On the other hand, um, the question is what, wait, wait, what are we protesting? You know, what does it mean that the owners are suddenly, uh, suddenly, be, suddenly, suddenly kind of jo joining um, in the protest? So what exactly set them off? Is it the idea that this bully has suggested that they should fire their employees, um, and not actually what Kaepernick was protesting, which was, of course, police brutality and, and police killings of, of, um, of black people. So since Kaepernick began his protest, I mean, he's very explicit about why he was doing this, right? Uh, he was a longstanding supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement, and um, he said, this is a quote, I'm not going to stand up to <clears throat> show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murders. This is his quote from, from over a year ago. Uh, <clears throat> now, so now since, he's, since his protest began, um, 41 unarmed people have been killed by the police, and uh, uh, 12 of them are black. Um, and so, you know, this is really, for, for him and for many of those of us who sympathize with him and, and, are, and join him in this protest, um, th this is a protest about police killing of unarmed people. Um, this is not simply about the militarization of the police, this is about how the police are actually militaries now. I mean, they're actually, this is what Sylvester Johnson argues, that we, we you know, we're not even talking about the militarization of the police, the police are, have actually are actually targeting civilians, just regular people, unarmed people. This is, a, this is what, we're, what we're trying to you know, think through. Um, but the 
process on Sundays, I think, were quite confused. And very, so we don't have, it's not exactly clear what people were protesting on Sundays. That's what I want to talk about um, today. What happens to the ways in which that protest, as it, as it grows, in fact, becomes depoliticized. The other, the other piece of it that I want to um, think through is the ways in which race and religion um, are made visible and invisible um, um, in the story. So you may not remember this, but when the, when the, when the protest around Kaepernick first started, um, there, uh, he was being compared. I mean, there's a lot of different things that happened. One of the things that happened was on Twitter. I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, uh, but um, I, I am, and it's an interesting space to be in. Um, uh, but there were a lot of uh, tweets around, you know, that there were links to Kaepernick. I mean, these are bizarre tweets, but there were like, links to Kaepernick and the 9-11 hijackers. Or some people had sort of said that well, this, his, his protest is somehow linked to the fact that he may have be dating a Muslim woman, or there were some kind of allusions to Islam that may have like influenced this whole thing, right? So that um, is uh, struck me as really um, I don't know suggestive, interesting, provocative, something that I wanted wanted to explore. The other thing that I was as I was watching this play out was um, the nature of the nature of the criticism of what what was it exactly about the the, the uh, Kaepernick's critics um, that was so familiar. And part of that was um, because I'd made a film about a man who was essentially, um, was, who was being referred to as the Kaepernick of the 90s. And I'm going to show you some clips from that film. Uh, and so it was the same kind of thing of like shut up and play um, and, and um, you know, this notion that uh, he's making so much money. Um, so Jelena Cobb refers to this as the, you know, uh, ungrateful as the new uppity. And so this notion of, you know, who has the right to protest, if you're making a certain amount of money, you should be allowed to protest, that idea. Um, and so that's, you'll see this in the clips that I'm about to show you, that that's actually a very old kind of argument and critique that's lodged against um, black athletes that do this kind of protest. But the other, the other thing that I thought, which I think, um, I think is instructive for us to think about today, and I want us to talk about this, is the, the way in which confusion gets mobilized. We can think about the confusion around Sunday, like what are, what's actually being protested? Are we protesting the flag? Are we protesting the military? Are we protesting what's actually being protested? And um, this idea is partly linked to the, the nature of symbols themselves. So the flag can be a polarizing national symbol because as with all symbols, its meaning is essentially in the eye of the beholder. So to those who are offended by Kaepernick or the protest, the flag represents the best of our American values, right? Uh, so in contrast, Kaepernick sees the flag as a symbol of the US government, and he faults that government for being inactive and callous to the uh, killings of black people by the police. So this is the very nature of symbols, and this is um, you know, partly what I want us to think through. What the flag stands for is not self-evident in its stars and stripes. And so the ritual of the anthem in sports culture usually, if superficially, unifies sports fans before dividing that arena into two camps uh, and two sides uh, you know, who are competing. But these protests, these moments of protest, actually reveal the much more complex and divisive racial and political fractures in, in, in ways that we see um, the flag, in ways that we see our place in this country, and, and um, you know, different, different political fractures. Um, so, um, you know, kind of like, I'll just sort of continue Omid's joke. When, when, when this happened last fall, I had actually um, just put the film that I had made about Mahmoud al for formerly Chris Jackson, on the internet. Uh, you know, the distribution company had uh, lost their rights, so I just put it back basically on, on the internet for free. And thinking that, well, okay, maybe once in a while teachers use this in classes, it's a 10-year-old ten, story. And then this story broke, and suddenly the you know became viral again. ESPN wanted me to come on the show. They they well, it just became a, a thing. I wrote a thing for ESPN. I, and they, I'm not usually invited to go on ESPN. So this was like a new thing for me. It was like a new de new demographic that was suddenly interested in my opinion. Um, and so um, um, I I thought that um, you know I thought so. There's a number of comparisons that we'll, we we can think through today, um, but I think that it's actually instructive to to look at the ways in which um, that story, not just, the, not just the parallels to Kaepernick, but also the, the, the ways in which um, Mahmoud's blackness and his Islam get, be, are made both visible and invisible in different moments in relation to um, his protest. So I'm just going to show you like, the, the first clip um, of just a few minutes. Of course, 
they gave me some time. I, was, I would have just shown you the whole film, but they wanted me to talk instead because he's actually more interesting than I am. So why don't we just show that first clip. I'll show you this little bit of a news clip. Um, so if you just play that for me. <laughs> He's number one on the court, one of the best scoring guards in the NBA. But tonight, the basketball star is benched indefinitely for not standing for the national anthem. I feel that uh, he should stand up. I mean, he's in America. He gets paid by the American company, so. That's what this country is all about. You have the right to do as you want to. I can understand his religious beliefs, but there are rules to the game, and he has to abide by the rules like everyone else. In 1993, Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf announced he was no longer Chris Jackson, changing his name in accordance with his faith. But some fellow Muslims, even the man who gave Abdul-Raouf his name, are disappointed with the player's actions. I was disappointed with the news that he did not stand because that related or they connect Mahmoud to Islam. Mahmoud Abdul Raouf has been a role model and mentor for young people, and tonight they too are split on their support. I mean, America is the reason why uh, he's making the big bucks, and I mean, he should at least respect that. I feel that if that's his nature, you know, if that's where he was from, I feel that he can sit down if he wants to sit down. If he doesn't do that where he's from, I think that's how what he should do. But this is Denver, Colorado. I mean, we need to stand up for our national anthem. So the way I actually came to the story is I I, I I didn't actually not uh, you know this this happened in 1996 I came to this story in 2000 as a as a graduate student um, when I came across an article by Daniel Pipes who is a kind of um, career Islamophobe who's uh, you know for those of us who work on Islam we probably know him he's a neocon columnist author and a frequent media terrorism analyst. Um, and he had written actually an, an, an alarmist essay on the threat of Islam to Americans. And his argument was that Islam undermined the culture, customs, and laws and policies of the U.S. in more fundamental ways than fascism or Marxist-Leninist ideologies. Okay, so this is in, two, in the year 2000. So in this particular essay, he focused on the special threat to the U.S. posed by African-American converts to Islam because of their quote-unquote protest temperament and their special uh, susceptibility to the, to the contempt for America imported by Muslim immigrants. That, that's what made them so dangerous. And as evidence of the ways Islam turned American converts against their own country, he gave this example of Mahmoud Abdurraouf's 1996 suspension uh, from the NBA for not standing for the anthem. Uh, and, um, and then he actually uh, applauded the examples of Muslim immigrants who actually had condemned uh, Abdul Rauf. Um, so much of, much of the film, which we're not going to watch uh, most of it, I'm just going to show you a couple clips, is actually about the ways in which immigrant Muslims, for the most part, largely condemned Abdul Rauf and spent a lot of time in, in the in the public, in, in the media, sort of uh, saying, "Oh, we don't know what he's talking about," disavowing him, saying, "We love America," a lot of flag waving, and really performing their patriotic devotion. Um, and so that's really what the film explores, why that, why that happened. If you press play again, um, to, but, but, but actually before the controversy uh, happened, um, Mahmoud, previously Chris Jackson, had long been a public, um, had, had, lo had long been a kind of favorite human interest story, not only because of his kind of dramatic um, personal story, but also because he suffers from Tourette syndrome. So if you just play a little bit. <laughs> I used to practice all the time, and I'm working to the beat. And there's this invisible man, and wherever I dribble, he's there. And I shoot, he's right on the tip of the shot. And I'm, I'm trying to outdo this invisible man. He's as quick, if the quick, as quick as I go, he goes. And everywhere I go, there he is. And that's the way I would play the whole day. If I'm one-on-one -on -one with this invisible person. The child never crawled a day in his life. Once he was like seven months old, I said, I'd be right back. I was in the bed, right? When I got back, he was walking and I just, wow. it freaked me out. I was wow. screaming, you know? I said, what? I said, Chris is walking. This kid was different. I guess I was Mr. Mom and Mr. Dad. <laughs> My boys, 
and mean, we were something else. Mostly my mother went to work from five in the morning. And during that time is when I really found basketball. I grew up without a father, so, um, you know, I think I've always been a strong-willed person, uh, very disciplined. If, if I put my mind to something, I stick to it. And, you know, basketball became a way for, uh, um, it became that father figure that I never had. So that's why, I mean, I would always just, to take, you know, take my mind off of that, I would always spend my time just playing basketball. And from there on, the love grew, and I just kept playing. And I was that determined at that age, being 10 years old, that I want to be a professional basketball player, and nothing is going to discourage me. Growing up in the conditions that we grew up in, we had to grow up real fast. My mother having to work and raise three children, and in that environment where you have drugs, you have prostitution, you right up the next street, and she's gone, and we're there basically to ourselves. That was real hard. And during that time, I can remember the KKK marching. I've always had a, when I was early, uh, when I was younger, I always prayed a lot uh, for God to bless me. be able to take care of my family. I would spend hours just thinking about, I have to take care of my brothers. This is the only way out for us. This is the only way out that I had. You know, it was just not a game for me. It was a way out. You know, some kids nowadays, they play it and it's just a game, it's fun. But it wasn't always fun for me. I was tired because I would put so much energy and effort. I mean, I would leave the court almost breathless. Was always out there with that ball. Never did do no homework. He would come in, he would sit down and eat. He'd put the ball right there by the table. So what is, what is with this ball? This, this was me, this is my reaction. You about to drive me crazy with this ball, sitting down here by the, by the bed, and he gets through eating, he'll get up, he'll take the ball, and he'll leave. He go get in the tub, he got the ball. Jesus. So I never thought nothing about the ball. Cause they just love a ball, that's it. So part of what you see here is that, you know, he, he's, um, he has, because he has Tourette syndrome, he, it's, it's, a, it's obsessive compulsive. And so part of his playing is also obsessive compulsively playing, which his mom doesn't understand. Um, and so then he also, you know, has the, uh, something that's also partly why he becomes so good. So part, so part of, part of what, made him so beloved and, uh, to fans. I mean, he was sort of seen as, they called him the Mississippi Sun, playing on the Sun, S-U-N and S-O-N. I mean, he was sort of the pride of the state. And also, when he went to Louisiana State, he was the star player. Even though he, he's, he's under six feet tall, and he's on a team with Shaquille O'Neal, but he was the star. So, you know, he has this extraordinary career in college. Um, and is a rising star in the NBA. And he quietly converts to Islam in 1991. Um, and so, you know, he, so he was, he, so he has the, really, there's no, not really much controversy around him. Um, and so he's really this, this really quite compelling figure. And you can see, you know, I think from the clips why he's actually quite beloved. Um, also, his mom is also very charming, um, um, Jackie. Anyway, um, so it, when, he, when he converts to Islam, and by the way, he's basically an autodidact because he was an undi he had Tourette's and was undiagnosed. He was put in a special track in school and essentially, um, you know, was uh, just was not really receiving a proper education. He said that the first time he read a book from cover to cover, the first book he ever read was actually in college, and that was the autobiography of Malcolm X. So can you imagine that? Going through, you know, 12 years of schooling and never actually reading a book, right? So it's pretty extraordinary, and someone who's extremely intelligent. Um, and so he's essentially a self-taught person. So um, in any case, and he, and he, was, he was undiagnosed with Tourette's for most of his life. He didn't get diagnosed properly until he was in high school. 
Um, so it's really, uh, in many ways, a tragic story, um, but also an extraordinary story of, you know, the, the, of success in many ways. Um, so anyways, he converts to Islam, and then for about six, for he decides, he's, you know, for, for political reasons and religious reasons, he's not going to stand for the national anthem because he, um, you know, sort of for about 60 games, is, is staying in a locker room um, during the stadium uh, as the national anthem is being played, and then he kind of walks quietly under the court um, for the starting lineup, and nobody really says a word. Everybody knows it's not really a big deal, and then it becomes um, a story when there's one small article in 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 um, the Den in one of the Denver local Denver papers, and then it become it gets reported in the on the radio, and then it becomes a national um, story that leads ultimately to um, the the NBA suspension. Um, that suspension only lasts for a game, but um, the the impact that it has on his career is profound, and so I think. You know, spending time on the that moment, which for for most of us is just like a blip on our radar screen, right? But profoundly impacts this man's life, and actually is incredibly revealing about the kinds of kind of racial, um, I don't know, imaginary that existed long before 9/11, right? So we think, oh, post, we always talk about post 9/11 or like the racialization of Islam post 9/11. All of these things were deeply entrenched in our psyche about the ways in which we imagine. Who Muslims are, what real Islam is, who, um, all that stuff existed long, long before 9/11 happened. Um, and so, even when you think back to like that first clip that I showed you, and that young woman who's actually defending him says, well, "Maybe that's what they do where he's from, right?" She assumes that he must be from some other place, meaning from like the middle, some faraway land, like the Middle East or something like that. She assumes that he's not black, right? So his his Islam gets decoupled from his blackness because of his protest and because of his, his name change. Um, and also, I mean, um, I won't show you the clip, but when he decides to change his name from Chris Jackson to Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, you know, his, a lot of people warned him not to do that, um, but it actually is a relatively smooth process. In fact, the chant at games becomes, Rauf, Rauf, Rauf is on fire, you know, so that it, it, it actually is not a huge <laughs> problem. I mean, they, 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 it, they manage it. Um, because again, he was such a beloved player, um, but really, this is what what um, profoundly changes changes things for him. So let me just show you another clip that's further along. Nugget star Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, who practiced with the team this afternoon, was suspended just 20 minutes before game time for violating his contract by refusing to stand for the national anthem. Abdul Rauf also says he's opposed to standing for the flag, which many here consider a symbol of freedom. It's also a, a symbol of oppression, uh, of tyranny. The Nugget star converted to the Islam faith in 1991. Two years later, he legally changed his name from Chris Jackson to Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, which means elegant and praiseworthy, most merciful, most kind. He says Muslims don't honor any nationalistic ideology, something his former college teammate Shaquille O'Neal, whose father is Muslim, understands. Muslims have different beliefs and they have different anthems. I mean, and, you know, uh, you just have to respect that. He didn't just start doing it. I mean, he's been a Muslim for three years, and I've, I've seen him not honor the national anthem for two years, so I don't know how they evolved around, you know, suspending him when they did. Mahmoud had not been standing for the flag at the end of the previous season. He would be in the uh, locker room, he would be in the hallway, he would wait until the national anthem uh, was completed, and then he would uh, silently, uh, without any um, fanfare, just walk onto the court, and uh, they would announce the starting lineups, and he would be there and just play basketball. And as, as the next season came along, uh, I think it had been about, um, oh, it must have been about 30, 35 games that he had not been standing for the national anthem the previous, uh, the, the uh, next season. What caused me not to stand was just my Muslim conscience uh, and, and what I understood and what I understand now. Uh, I couldn't see myself knowing the relationship that the United States government had and has with what's going on in the world, with starvation, with wars, with the economical strangulation, with all of these things, I could not see myself as an individual stand for a symbol that represented that. We're getting ready to play Orlando. The trainer comes out, Mahmoud, Bernie wants to see you. 
I go down to his office. They were trying to convince me to stay in. And they give me an example. We're Jewish, for example. I said, well, I'm not Jewish. I'm Muslim. And I'm not standing. He said, well, they're, they're going to find you. So let them find me. They're going to suspend you. Let them suspend me. I'm not going to stand. You know, I like all my players to line up and, and be attentive as a sign of respect. What's wrong with that guy? He signed on the dotted line. That's the rules of the game. I don't necessarily agree with what he's saying, but I respect his uh, freedom to to express himself. The lead shit had nothing to do with that. They had, that was way too tough. I called the NBA official and I asked him, was this a rule where he has to stand? And he said, well, I don't know if it's been a rule. He's expected to stand. And he could not tell me that it was indeed a rule or not a rule. Finally, somebody, an athlete, somebody who's um, making a lot of money, standing up for what he believes in, um, and we just don't see a lot of that these days. You look back in the 1960s, you had Muhammad Ali, not boxing for three years because of his religious beliefs. You've seen some uh, Jewish athletes um, not wanting to participate um, during religious holidays. The difference this time was that, you know, it was all wrapped in the American flag. Um, uh, yeah. Um, okay. So um, we'll, talk, we'll talk about Muhammad Ali in just a, in just a moment. Um, uh, but um, so I wanted to say a, um, a, a, a couple of things um, about about the way in which the, the media clip that you just watched. So part of it is about the the sound bite and the explanation of why Mahmoud was not standing. Um, and so several uh, journalists reported that Mah wrongly reported that Mahmoud uh, Abdurraouf was a from the Nation of Islam. Um, and uh, so he is not. Um, but implicit in that is this notion that he's not like a real Muslim or he got, has like the wrong Islam and you know and that so some, putting somebody like Hakeem Olajuwon who's like a real Muslim from like a real Muslim country in Africa somewhere is part of the the, the continued representation of like real Muslims against a not an, in, an inauthentic Muslim. So African American Muslims are consistently sort of represented um, as somehow not fully Muslim or like you know, political po politics in the guise of religion, um, you know, warmed over race politics that's pretending to be religious. And so much of the analysis in much of the media um, was, in fact, sort of deconstructing, well, is this really religion? You know, is this protest really religious or is this just his, like, p politics? And part of it was actually the way in which the soundbite was broken up. So he says a couple of different things about, you know, I'm a, I'm a Muslim first and a Muslim last. My duty is to my creator, not to a nationalistic ideology. So this became the theological explanation of why, of his, of his descent. Um, and then the other thing that was quoted from the other, the other soundbite was, the flag is also a symbol of oppression, of tyranny. So it depends on how you look at it. I think this country has a long history of that. If you look at history, I don't think you can argue the facts. Um, and then he goes on, and this is the quote that is usually left out of the clips. He goes on and says, um, you can't be for God and for oppression. It's clear in the Quran. Okay? So in, in reality, these three sentences were said back to back. But in the way they were presented in the media coverage, they were always broken up, and that third sentence was usually not included. In fact, I only found it because I got the original footage from one of the um, TV, uh, TV studios. They actually sent me the whole, like the, 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 the raw footage. Um, so the excluded sentence actually makes it quite clear that for, for Mahmoud, you know, the, the, the political and religious beliefs are not so easily bifurcated. But it, this, this notion that they can be so clearly separated is, I think, actually um, really what's, what's trying, what, what's that, what's that, what's, what's, what, we, what we need to really explore here. Um, <clears throat> all right, the other thing I wanted to just quickly get at before we, we move on is that um, um, this, this, the Olajuwon statement, he says, you know, um, when he says, the difference must be from, from what he says, okay, uh, let me just quickly read it. He said this in the New York Times. Uh, Olajuwon reproduces this clean binary. He says the difference must be, 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 must be distinguished between worship and respect. Islam orders you to obey and respect as long as you're not worshiping anything other than God. The Quran teaches respect for all people. That's why it's so important that people understand that there's a difference between respect and worship. People that worship the flag should also understand that there's a difference. Islam is a religion of peace. You don't attack, you explain. 
Uh, and so, just like Mahmoud Abdul Rauf's two sound bites, Elijah wants two sound bites, the one you heard and the one I just read, are also these two correctives, right? Um, well, what is so interesting here is that Islam is being presented as if there is one answer or one interpretation that's the right one, which itself is really uh, bizarre, right? I mean, um, there's this notion that like, if we can just find what Islam really says, then we can get at the real heart of whether or not this protest is allowable. Um, um, and of course, in terms of the, the legal piece of this, which was, which was a big part of the debate, is that does this fall under protected speech under the free exercise clause of the First Amendment? Um, that was a big part of the, the debate, which I won't go into right now. Okay, um, let's go to um, clip 4021. With a situation like Mahmoud Abdul Rauf uh, refusing to stand up uh, to the flag, he was acting as a good American. Allah tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuha ladhin aminu kunu kawa min al bilqist, shuhada lillah, O you have attained the faith, be ever steadfast in upholding justice, bearing witness to the truth for the sake of Allah. Not for the sake of just the Muslims, not for the sake of, of, of just the Christians or the Jews, but, and, uh, and don't stand up for justice just for yourself. No, this is a broad statement. Justice is justice. I'm not here to talk, I'm here to play basketball. If you want to ask me about basketball, I'll talk about basketball. All I can say is he's back, and uh, we're big enough to move on. The Nuggets hit the road with Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. The standoff about standing, the NBA won. Rauf will stand not to honor the flag, the Muslim will pray to his God. Reports say Muslim basketball stars Akeem Olajuwon and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar helped convince Rauf to change his position. But the guards' belief that the American flag represents, among other things, oppression and tyranny is unchanged. Expect Rauf's reception to be rather hostile. He hasn't admitted to making a mistake. He's just settled for a compromise. The suspension only lasted for a game. I decided to come back to the league uh, to stand because I spoke to a brother who enlightened me about what the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, did when a Jewish funeral was passing by. He stood up and they said, why are you standing? He says, I'm not standing for that cause. I'm standing because Allah gave a life and he took a life away. So he said, you can stand, but it doesn't mean that you have to stand for that cause. And I, heard, I said, wow, the prophet did that. So, okay. And that eased my pain. So I started making a dua, a prayer for the oppressed, for people struggling, all of that, when I would stand. I'll be looking to see what prayer he going to sing so I can say the same prayer he saying. And I'm glad that he's back and standing. Whatever he does, if he wants to pray or whatever, I feel uh, he needs to stand. I don't think they should play the national anthem at any sporting event. You know, then we wouldn't have this problem. When I didn't stand for the flag, that's the year I got traded to, to Sacramento. You knew right away that a line had been stepped over. This is probably not going to last for Mahmoud. He needs to be moved because the NBA um, would look at that as in, ter in business terms. You know, we're trying to sell a product here. Let's try to make this disappear and move on. When I got traded to Sacramento, they didn't play me much the first year. Uh, and the second year, they played me even less. And a lot of games, I didn't even see the court, did not play. They had DNP, did not play because of coach's decision. And never have I really gotten those. Usually people would come to me because of what I did in Denver. Numbers I put up, leading the team and scoring four years in a row, assists four years in a row. They would come to me, why aren't you playing? Well, that year, no one even approached. I can penetrate. You don't need to set a pick for me to get my shot. I can, get my, I can go get my shot myself. I'm a big guy, small guy, but these guys can't get their shots off like I. How in the world are they getting picked up and I can't get picked up? I said, I know what they're trying to do. I'm trying to blackball me. So, um, um, 
Anyway, so as you can see, clearly that didn't that didn't um, satisfy um, the the critics. Um, the league's decision to suspend him was, of course, um, influenced by the fear that the economic consequences of dissatisfied fans might translate translate to a re reduction um, in um, ticket sales. Um, there had been a similar controversy actually uh, several years earlier when um, he had been covering up Nike's uh, uh, swoosh on his shoes. And that had been another kind of protest that he'd been involved in, and they had been there had been some um, a little bit of a scuffle over that. Um, so there, so this was kind of a consistent thing with between him and 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 um, the team, where he his politics or his willing willingness to protest was a sort of point of friction. Um, of course, there's another important iconic athlete that was mentioned briefly in the film, um, who of course challenged this division between religion and politics in a much more profound and radical way than Abdul Rauf. Muhammad Ali, and it was of course in the name of Islam that Muhammad Ali had refused to serve the uh, serve America in the time of war, and as a result was nearly uh, imprisoned, lost his title, was banned from competing, was condemned by the national media. Uh, <clears throat> um, it's, it's, we may not all remember how profoundly hated Ali was. In 1967, in 1967, Ali refused to step forward to be inducted into Vietnam, and within the hour before being charged with any crime, the New York State Athletic Commission suspended his boxing title and stripped him of his, ti his title as heavyweight champion with all other jurisdictions in the U.S. quickly following suit. Yet today, of course, uh, he's remembered as a national icon, in fact, as the quintessential American. And Louisville, the city that once legally renounced him, now boasts a highway in his name. Now, I'm not just bringing up Muhammad Ali only because he's a, the most famous example of a dissenting athlete, which of course he is, or because, like Abdul Rauf, he's black and Muslim, but rather the comparison to Ali brings Abdul Rauf's case into relief because Ali's image was reinvented in, in the same year that this happened, in 1996. What happened in 1996? The opening ceremony of the Olympics. Muhammad Ali raised a trembling arm to light the fuse to the Olympic cauldron, followed by an excerpt from Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington speech. The widely broadcast image suggested a kind of fulfillment of King's dream in the national embrace of Ali as an icon of harmony and goodwill. Outside the stadium, uh, Williams, a former colleague of King's, led a small protest against the Georgia State flags, Confederate stars, and bars fluttering over the games that celebrated human equality, but few reporters covered her demonstration. At halftime during the Olympic basketball final, Ali was presented with a replacement gold medal for the one he had purportedly flung into the Ohio River 36 years earlier, precisely because of the gaps between the Olympic ideals and American social realities. And USA Today credited Ali's Olympic cameo with a sparkling renaissance for the greatest, and he took Sports Illustrated's cover for a record-breaking 34th time. Now, for all that sudden interest in Ali's legacy, the fact that in his heyday he had always been more popular abroad than at home was forgotten. After all, his anti-American defiance is what made him an international hero in most of uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe in that period. Equally significant, it was his, Ali's Islam that seemed to be erased from collective memory as well. It seemed like his funeral last year was a moment when America was suddenly reminded that, oh yeah, he's Muslim. Um, <clears throat> equally significant, um, I'm sorry, analysts of the black power movement of the 60s frequently divide the radicalism of, of the movement between the elements that were co-opted and sanitized and those that were destroyed. Um, Muhammad Ali sadly d embodies both of those processes. He, he, his image was co-opted and depoliticized as a national icon decades after being the most reviled figure in American sports, and in some cases physically destroyed. After, strip after stripping his title and his resultant lengthy absence from, um, oops, we're seeing it. Oh, did I just miss a piece of paper? Okay. Well, I guess I'll. I won't. I don't want to. Oh, oh his, his resultant lengthy absence from the ring meant that when Ali finally returned to the ring, he was slower and had to rely on his ability to absorb punches, which is uh, likely related to his current med his 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 ultimate uh, the medical condition that that um, um, uh, left him unable to speak. Um, so the the Ali that was offered up. As for veneration in the 90s is not the Ali of the 60s, and the image of the 60s that is celebrated and, da and the damned in the 90s is a mere caricature of that original. Um, in both cases, a complex and contradictory reality gets homogenized, right, and repackaged for sale. Um, and um, I also just want to remind us, if, I don't know how many of you saw OJ's Made in America, which won the Oscar last year, but in the same moment that Ali was being reviled, of course, OJ is being celebrated, right? So when as Ali is hated, 
you have the, count, you have the anti Ali, which is O.J. Simpson, who said, of course, in 1968, when people like Kareem Abdul Jabbar are trying to convince O.J. to be part of the, pro, uh, the, the protest at the 1968 Olympics, and O.J. says, no. He said, all these black athletes are protesting the Olympics in 1968. He says, no, I'm not black, I'm O.J. Right? So there's a, that's the difference, and we need to be conscious of that. So when we think about you know, the different kinds of ways in which blackness and Islam um, are, being, are being mobilized. Um, and, and so the, 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 you know, the, the, in the 90s, of course, if there was the, the, the kind of, uh, I don't know, an analog to what O.J. was in the 60s, it was, of course, Michael Jordan. So if Mahmoud al-Rauf is resisting, is resisting American empire, is speaking out against is even hyper-political, is speaking out against Nike, who is embracing all of the kind of corporate America? Of course, it's Michael Jordan, right? You know what I mean? So we have that kind of counter um, figure. Uh, the CEO Jordan ad campaign that salvaged the company's image uh, for Nike. Um, so where, where Ali was the idealistic hero, carrying the banner of humanitarian internationalism in the global struggles against inequality, poverty, and injustice, Jordan, Michael Jordan, was that American emblem of globalization, right? Um, Jordan was a symbol of corporate America and its winner-takes-all ethic, and his blackness was deliberately submerged within his Americanness, reduced in the end his individual wealth and success. And so I think this just kind of comes back to Sunday. Um, certainly Kaepernick, you know, re sort of resurrects that legacy of Ali, but when we see those owners amid the pro amidst the protest, you know, that reminds me actually of Jordan <laughs> and uh, you know, the ways in which that, that, that radical legacy can also easily be quickly co-opted. So I'll end there and I'm um, looking forward to questions and discussion with you.